Radical Forgiveness by Brian Zond. Chapter 7, Killing the Hostility. Hostility, enmity, acrimony, animosity, aggression, malice, malevolence. When these destructive vices are present in an, invi- in an individual, the problem is bad enough. But when they are present within groups, clans, tribes, parties, and nations, the consequences can be truly horrific. The human race has a tragic history of drawing lines in hostility and relating to the whole world as either the accepted us or the alienated them. World history is largely the story of how political borders came into being. And behind every border is a bloody story told in terms of us versus them. In a world of alienation, the us versus them scenario seems natural to us as though it is the only way to understand the world. We seem to lack the imagination to envision life any other way. But must it be this way? Must us versus them be our controlling paradigm? The New Testament challenges this. Specifically, the gospel of the cross calls us to rethink the us versus them paradigm, and for very good reason. The us versus them attitude of groupthink hostility is the source of humanity's most shameful crimes racism, torture, war, and genocide. If the gospel is to offer solutions for mankind's greatest problems, and if the gospel is to have relevance beyond the realm of private piety and afterlife religion, it must be able to address the curse of deep-seated and historic hostility. The Apostle Paul's theology of the cross is a gospel that addresses this very issue. Paul boldly states that the cross kills groupthink hostility. In the increasingly hostile world of the 21st century, where the church is all too prone to participate in the us versus them mentality, this is a gospel we vitally need to recover. Let's consider the human experience. Human beings are the most social of all of God's creatures. We cannot live any other way. We require, we require a social existence not only for survival, but also for definition. We understand ourselves in the context of the groups to which we belong. Who are we? We are our family, our religion, our nationality, our ethnicity, our class, our politics, and the football team we root for. No man is an island entire of itself. But who we are is often understood today most clearly in terms of who we aren't. We are us because we are not them. Unfortunately, at least I consider this unfortunate, the the easiest way to unite people is to unite them against something. We are more prone to have passion for what we oppose than for what we support. Negativity is easily energized, especially on the internet. The tendency to define ourselves in the negative is most easily done if we can personify what we are not as a group of people, the dreaded other, the hated them. Skillful politicians understand this very well, and manipulative politicians know how to use it, not to mention the devil. And so we divide into our respective groups based on similar characteristics, shared opinion, and common interest. If we nurture the antagonism of groupthink hostility toward the others, the the alienated them, that hostility so corrupt, that hostility can so corrupt our thinking that we deprive them of their full humanity. Once that is done, all things are permitted. To regard others as inhuman is to sanction actions that are inhuman. If the Nazi denies the humanity of the Jew, if the Serb denies the humanity of the Bosniak, if the Hutu denies the humanity of the Tutsi, then all things are permitted, including genocide. Of course, groupthink hostility rarely results in the the ultimate extreme of genocide, but the extreme serves to warn us just how dangerous cultivating hostility can be. God's Peace Project. In the hostile world of hate, war, and genocide, a cross appears. The cross is God's peace project designed to end the hostility and achieve reconciliation. The cross not only achieves peace between God and the alienated sinner, but the cross is also the place where God forms a new humanity, a humanity saved from hostility.
This is the theology of the cross that Paul sets forth in his letter to the Ephesians. And to show the effectiveness of the cross in killing the hostility and thereby achieving peace, Paul applies it to one of the most intractable us versus them divides of his day, the division between Jews and Gentiles, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility, thereby killing the hostility, ESV. Ephesians 2, 15 to 16, New Revised Standard Version. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul is writing to the young, predominantly Gentile church of Ephesus on the west coast of Asia Minor, Turkey. These are people newly converted from the pagan religions of the Roman Empire to faith in Jesus Christ. He reminds these Gentile believers that in times past, Gentiles were excluded and alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Non-Jews were foreigners to the covenant, and as foreigners, they were without hope of attaining full citizenship in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was understood as entirely synonymous with the nation of Israel. The Jewish mind of the first century understood citizenship in the kingdom of God, Israel, as based upon three crucial factors, ethnicity, circumcision, and Torah observance, all which, inclu- all which excluded Gentiles. The only way an ethnic Gentile could obtain the blessings and promises of Israel was to be circumcised and observe the cultural markers of the Torah, dietary laws, Sabbath observance, Jewish purification rites, and so forth. In other words, then the only way a Gentile could become a citizen of Yahweh's kingdom was to become a Jew. So the Jewish thought was this, to be accepted by God, you must become one of us. But they should have known better. From the outset of his redemption project, God made it clear to Abraham that what he would accomplish through Abraham and his seed was intended for the whole world. What God began with Abraham grew into a family, then into a tribe, and finally into a nation, kingdom, and culture. At the heart of the nation of Israel was their temple, the place where the chosen people could encounter the living God. But Israel failed to live in covenant faithfulness with God. They broke covenant with God through idolatry and injustice. Despite the attempts of the prophets to turn Israel back to God, judgment finally fell in the form of destruction and exile. After the Babylonians destroyed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 586 BC, the Hebrew prophets began to cast a vision for what a rebuilt and restored temple might look like. The prophet Isaiah envisioned a temple founded upon justice that would welcome foreigners Gentiles. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offering, their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isaiah 56, 1, 3, 7, NIV. But Isaiah's vision of a justice and a Jewish temple that would accept foreigners was a minority report that was never implemented. By the time Herod the Great had completed his expansion of the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem around the time of Jesus' birth, the temple had become one of the architectural marvels of the Mediterranean world. Gentiles came from all over the Roman Empire to see Herod's temple, but Gentiles were prohibited from actually entering the holy precincts of the temple. Gentiles could observe as tourists, but not participate as worshipers. So much for Isaiah's vision of a temple that would be a house of prayer for all the nationalities. There was even a wall placed around the holy precincts of the temple with an inscription carved in stone every few feet. The inscription restricted Gentile access in no uncertain terms. Archaeological remains of this dividing wall and its inscription have been found. The prohibiting inscription read, No foreigner is to go beyond this wall. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. This was the us versus them divide set literally in stone. 
and it made it very clear how the Jews felt about the possibility of Gentiles joining them. We are chosen, and you're not. We're in, and you're out. If you cross this line, we will kill you. This is how the us versus them mentality usually plays out. It results in the erection of walls that engender hostility. The Apostle Paul says this is the very thing that the cross of Christ destroys. Paul says the division, the alienation, the us versus them attitude, and even the very wall in the temple complex that created such hostility are all removed through the cross. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the that hostility thereby killing the hostility, the ESV says. Ephesians 2, 13 to 16, NRSV, emphasis added. The kingdom of heaven on earth. Paul presents the cross as the place where God ends human hostility and forms a new humanity, a new humanity capable of living together in peace. Paul then goes on for the rest of the chapter to talk about how Gentile believers and Messiah are now given full citizenship in the kingdom of God. Gentile believers are now joined to the Jewish saints. As Jesus had predicted, many Gentiles were coming from the east and the west and sitting at the table of covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish patriarchs. This is the kingdom of heaven coming on earth. Paul goes on to say that a new temple is now built upon the foundation of the Jewish apostles and Jewish prophets with the Jewish Messiah, as the cornerstone. The whole purpose of this accomplishment is the establishment of peace. This is all contained in the great mystery, which was given to the Apostle Paul, the mystery of the acceptance of the Gentiles through the work of the Jewish Messiah. In his similar letter to the Colossian church, Paul speaks of belief in Christ among the Gentiles as the hope of glory, which the prophets foretold. It is because Gentiles can be joined to the God of Israel in Messiah that the prophetic hope of the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh covering the earth as the waters cover the sea can at last be fulfilled. Now, in Messiah, the chosen race is the human race, and the Holy Land is the whole earth. This is the promise of God, the hope of the prophets, and the gospel of the apostles. This is God's plan, which was begun in Abraham, culminated in Christ, proclaimed by the apostles, and carried out by the church. Paul understands that Jesus the Messiah has reformed, reframed, and redefined Israel in such a way that citizenship in the kingdom of God is no longer based upon the exclusive markers of ethnicity, circumcision, and Torah observance, but upon the open-to-all possibilities of faith, baptism, and obedience to Messiah. Christ invites the whole world into the saving covenant. This is God's great work of egalitarian salvation. Not everyone can be an ethnic Jew. Not everyone can be circumcised. Half of the population is excluded. Not everyone can live in a culture adapted to Torah observance. But everyone can believe in Jesus as Messiah. Everyone can be baptized. Everyone can join the community of those committed to learning to live a life of obedience to Messiah. Jesus rescued the kingdom of God from ethnic, national, and cultural exclusivity. This was always the vision of God. This is the gospel, the good news. But not everyone saw the redefinition of the kingdom of God as good news. One of the primary problems between Jesus and the Pharisees was the difference in their approaches to the us versus them attitude. While Jesus constantly challenged this attitude, the Pharisees tended to cherish it. It was religiously inspired hostility that the Pharisees cherished and Jesus challenged. This set Jesus and the Pharisees on an inevitable collision course. The Pharisees understood the kingdom of God as requiring the vigorous defense of the righteous us against the sinful them. Their interpretation of who was righteous and who was sinful 
was non-negotiable. They were the righteous, and those outside of their movement were the sinners. Black and white, plain and simple, us versus them. In considering their approach to the us versus them divide, it is important to remember who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were a conservative religious political party who saw it as their mission to take back Israel for God. They attempted to do this by identifying, denouncing, and distancing themselves from those whom they perceived to be the sinners within society, the non-observant, what we would call secular today, and the immoral. They specifically regarded tax collectors, prostitutes, adulterers, adulterers, drunkards, Sabbath breakers, and other non-observant Jews as the sinners who prevented the kingdom of God from coming in its fullness. The Pharisees were convinced that if they could convert a majority of the population to their movement, then God would send Messiah and restore Israel. Thus, the Pharisees saw those outside of their movement, those whom they identified as sinners, to be the reason why the full reign of God had not yet come to Israel. If they could ever produce a moral majority for the Pharisee party, at last the kingdom would come, or so they thought. Jesus' approach was the opposite. Jesus' practice was to welcome the very people alienated by the Pharisees. Jesus invited sinners to his table and offered them respect and forgiveness. Jesus called this practice the kingdom of God. Thus, the battle lines were drawn between Jesus and the Pharisees. The fundamental disagreement was this. Is the kingdom of God advanced through the erection or the removal of barriers? The Pharisees, the kingdom of God, would come when sinners were sufficiently marginalized within society. For Jesus, welcoming sinners to his table was the kingdom of God. For Jesus, the eradication of the us versus them attitude and the hostility it creates is a central ethic of the kingdom of God. Should the hostility between us versus them be enshrined or eradicated? The answer depends on whose approach to the kingdom of God you embrace the approach of Jesus or the approach of the Pharisees. It's no exaggeration to say that the, Pharisee, that the Pharisees showed their faithfulness to God by hating the right people. No doubt they could produce scriptures to support their position of religiously endorsed hatred. For example, David says in the Psalms, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. The incredibly radical thing Jesus did was to dare to challenge conventional and even scriptural concepts based on his own authority. So despite a scriptural endorsement for hating enemies, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. For the first century Jew, the effect was the same as if a preacher stood up today and said, the Bible says... But I say to you, upon his own authority, Jesus dared to countermand any scriptural endorsement for hating enemies. Instead of endorsing Moses or David, Jesus called for his disciples to love their enemies. And Jesus insisted that this alone is a mature imitation of our Heavenly Father. Yet, as easy as it is to cast the Pharisees in the role of villains... I have some sympathy for them. Their encounter with Jesus and his radical teachings put them in a difficult position. They were going to have to make very, a very hard decision. They were either going to remain true to their tradition and their understanding of the scriptures, or they would have to rethink everything based on the new and radical teachings of a young carpenter turned rabbi from Nazareth. To abandon a centuries-old paradigm for a radical new vision of the kingdom of God would be no easy task. Make no mistake about it. What Jesus was teaching was new, radical, and utterly unprecedented. Jesus was teaching a kind of love that no one before had dared to imagine, love of enemy. Jesus' radical vision of enemy love presented a fundamental challenge to the religious view of the Pharisees. The Pharisees hated sinners because they loved God so much or so they thought. For them, the us versus them paradigm was religiously, even scripturally, mandated. Jesus challenged all of that. 
Jesus taught that we show how much we love God by how we love our enemies. This is the 70 times 7 ethic taken to the extreme. Wayne Northey sums up Jesus' radical ethic of love like this. The biblical test case for love of God is love of neighbor. The biblical test case for love of neighbor is love of enemy. Failure to love the enemy is failure to love God. When hating your enemy is understood as hating God's enemy is when the us versus them paradigm of hostility takes on a religious nature. Hating your enemy, who is believed to be the enemy of God, becomes a demonstration of your love for God. The stoning of an adulterous woman can be an act of piety, an act of piety with scriptural endorsement. The Pharisees could rightly say, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, replacing condemnation with mercy. As the Bible says to stone adulterous women, shouldn't, I'm sorry, if the Bible says to stone adulterous women, shouldn't we stone them? Isn't this how the kingdom of God comes? By identifying, condemning, and punishing sinners? This is what the Pharisees believed. But Jesus challenged that. Jesus first responded by invalidating the Pharisees' us versus them divide. He did this by showing the Pharisees that they too were located within the category of sinners, that their cherished us versus them category was false and invalid. Jesus demolished their paradigm of hostility with his famous words, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus then replaced condemnation with mercy. Mercy triumphed over judgment. Jesus was the only one who truly was without sin and who alone possessed the right to condemn and throw the first stone. But Jesus refused to condemn. Instead, he forgave the women and called her to a new life. Jesus challenged the cherished idea that a person can demonstrate how much they love God by how much they hate sinners and enemies. But unfortunately, the corrupt idea that you can prove your love for God by hating the right people lives on. It's the demonic philosophy of the suicide bomber. Political conventions alone do not produce a suicide bomber. The kind of hate that can produce a suicide bomber, hate of enemy that outweighs love of life, requires a religious element. The suicide bomber is deeply religious. The suicide bomber goes to his violent and murderous death with a prayer on his lips. The suicide bomber loves God. The suicide bomber shows how much he loves God by how deeply he hates The suicide bomber loves God so much that he is willing to kill sinners and infidels on behalf of God and take his own life in the process. The suicide bomber loves by hating. The suicide bomber worships by hating. The suicide bomber gains heaven by hatred. The suicide bomber does what he does because he loves God, his God, the God he imagines, the God who is on his side. But this is not the God whom Jesus called Father. Before we easily dismiss religiously endorsed hate as an exclusively Muslim problem, we must hasten to remind ourselves that, sadly, the us versus them attitude of religious hostility also has a Christian history. Religiously inspired hate not only gives birth to jihad and suicide bombers, but it is also responsible for giving the world the bloody legacy of the Crusades and Inquisitions. Tragically, the church has an undeniable history of endorsing and practicing violent hatred of enemies. Ostensibly, ostensibly to prove love and devotion to God and to accomplish God's will. For nearly 200 years, 1095 to 1291, the Western Church sanctioned a series of military campaigns against Muslims, usually with the misguided motive of recovering the Holy Land. But the Crusades also unleashed the wanton slaughter of Jews and Greek Orthodox Christians. During the Crusades era, popes and bishops preached impassioned sermons, calling upon Christians to demonstrate their love for God by killing in the name of Christ and promising them heaven if they should die in the attempt. It doesn't make things any better when we understand that the various popes had political motives for launching their crusades and simply used religious rhetoric to gain popular support. 
Indeed, skillful politicians know how to manipulate us versus them, hostility for their purposes. Occasionally, I encounter a Christian who attempts to defend the Crusades by arguing that the Muslims were just as bad or worse. But that is hardly the point, is it? The point is that we cannot call ourselves followers of the one who called us to love our enemies by killing them in his name. Swinging a sword underneath a banner of a cross may be the ultimate exercise in missing the point. The cross is where Christ forgives his enemies, not kills them. The other bookend to the terror of the Crusades was the horror of the Inquisitions. During the Spanish Inquisition of the 16th century, tens of thousands of Jews were forcibly removed from Spain and thousands of suspected heretics were tortured or burned at the stake. And lest Protestants feel their history is above the fray, we should remind ourselves that John Calvin defended the burning of the heretic theologian Michael Servetus in Geneva in 1553. Calvin justified the execution of heretics with this reasoning. There is no question here of man's authority. It is God who speaks, and clear it is what law he will have kept in the church, even to the end of the world. Wherefore does he demand of us a so extreme severity, if not to show us that due honor is not paid him, so long as we set not his service above every human consideration, so that we spare not kin nor blood of any, and forget all humanity when the matter is to combat for his glory. Calvin argued that God's due honor demands extreme severity and requires us to forget all humanity and combat for his glory. And how does Calvin combat for his glory? By endorsing the execution of those who reject Christian theology. But the New Testament argues that God's glory was defended by the cross and that God was glorified when Jesus forgave his enemies from the cross. Furthermore, Calvin defended the burning of heretics by imagining that this was what law, God, would have kept in the church. But the Apostle James speaks of the royal law as loving your neighbor as yourself. Quite bluntly, God's glory and God's honor are not defended by burning people at the stake. The church is built upon the shed blood of Christ, not the shed blood of heretics and infidels. Crusaders and inquisitors committed their atrocities in the name of defending the faith. But what faith? Not the faith of Jesus. Not the faith of the apostles. Rather, it is the faith that justifies us versus them hostility in the name of God. Our culture war hostility. So much for history. What about today? What about the American evangelical church in the 21st century? Hopefully, we are done with crusades and inquisitions. But do we still try to prove how much we love God and how faithful we are to God by how much hostility we hold towards certain groups? Secularists, liberals, homosexuals, Muslims, or even toward other Christians whom we deem insufficiently orthodox? Is there an unspoken pressure to prove our righteousness by demonstrating a certain level of contempt toward these groups? Is there a kind of conservative Christian political correctness that requires a certain level of thinly veiled hostility? Have we embraced an Ann Coulter Christianity and made apostles of Rush, Beck, and Hannity instead of recognizing that they are simply entertainers and profiteers in America's culture war? I fear that far too many followers of Christ have been sucked into the angry political polarization that characterizes our culture, a culture that has come to venerate the enraged rant as an art form. And when we do this, the name Christian is diminished to an adjective for modifying certain political positions rather than a noun for a person who is deliberately attempting to imitate Jesus Christ. This absolutely must change. We can hold all the convictions we want as long as we can hold them in love, but we must take our culture war hostility to the cross and kill it. For one thing, I'm not sure it is helpful to automatically identify secularists, homosexuals, and Muslims as enemies. 
But even if we do, the fact remains that Jesus calls us to love and bless our enemies and not mock and revile them. Let's get this clear. Loving the homosexual is no more an endorsement of homosexuality than Jesus' refusal to stone the adulterous woman was an endorsement of adultery. Because Jesus would not stone an adulterer did not mean Jesus was pro-adultery. Because Paul addressed the pagans of Athens respectfully did not mean Paul was pro-paganism. As we learn to sincerely love and respect secularists, homosexuals, and Muslims, it does not mean that we advocate secularism, support gay marriage, or endorse Islam. It simply means we are attempting to be authentic followers of Christ by granting everyone respect and dignity. We must not be intimidated by the advocates of hostility who set up a false dichotomy and insinuate that a refusal to express animosity toward non-Christian groups is a de facto collusion with their position. Because Jesus did not practice the hostility of the Pharisees towards sinners, he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Of course, Jesus was neither. Jesus simply refused the false notion that holiness can be demonstrated by hostility. A mistaken understanding of holiness has a long history of getting mixed up with hostility. And in the distance, and in the distance, the Jesus lovers sat with hard condemning faces and watched the sin. Thus, John Steinbeck depicts the world denying Pentecostals in the grapes of wrath as self-righteous, self-appointed morality police who take perverse pleasure in condemning the Saturday night square dance in the California migrant camp. Steinbeck's terse portrayal of the Jesus lovers is unflattering, but not an unfair invention of fiction. Unfortunately, such people do exist, and in their existence, they horribly distort the good news of Jesus Christ. The worst way to define ourselves as Christian is in the negative, what we are against Seinbach's migrant camp Jesus lovers were against dancing and most other expressions of humanness, of course, of humanness. Of course, it is a caricature, but only in that it is perhaps an exaggeration. Sadly, though, there remains the misguided tendency to identify ourselves by what we condemn. And thus the us versus them paradigm of religious hostility lives on. I fear that through the cultivation of an us-versus-them attitude, we as evangelical Christians are communicating a subtle, or at times not so subtle, hostility toward the wider culture. The wider culture of blue state America is well aware that we hold them in contempt. Ask a non-evangelical to define what evangelicals believe, and odds are he or she will not speak in terms of a personal salvation experience, the classical marker of evangelicalism, but will give you a summary of political positions and a list of cultural issues evangelicals are, suppo- are opposed to. That these issues may indeed be real evils and not the innocent dance of Steinbeck's novel is beside the point. The question remains, do we really want to be primarily identified by what we are against? Do we want to be known for our angry voices and furrowed brows? Don't we have some good news to identify us? At the heart of that good news, don't we find the embracing message of acceptance and forgiveness? Join the dance of humanness. Here are a few questions that are keys in overcoming an us versus them attitude and the hostility it breeds. What do we think of the world? Are we of the world or not? I'm sorry, are we part of the world or not? Do we love the world or not? Do we have hope for the world or not? These questions throw us headlong into the controversy. There are Christians who would answer these questions with a thundering, no, we're not part of the world, we don't love the world, and we have no hope for this doomed world. There are also Christians who would answer these questions with with an enthusiastic, yes, we belong to this world, We love this world, and we have hope for God's good world. So who's right? If we look to the scriptures for guidance, as we should, things get interesting. The Bible's answer to these questions, do we belong to the world, 
Do we love the world? Is there hope for the world? Is yes and no. Consider these two well-known biblical passages from the same apostle. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John three sixteen to 17. What's going on here? Are we supposed to love the world or not? Is God condemning the world or not? Is the world passing away or being saved? And in case you are wondering, it's the same Greek word, cosmos. Herein lies the problem. Some Christians are Epistle of John chapter 2 enthusiasts, while others are Gospel of John chapter 3 adherents. The simple truth is that we must hold to both concepts of cosmos. We must learn to live in the exquisite tension of John's dual use of cosmos. So let me put it as simply as I can. The world, the world as a system of rebellion against God is corrupt and doomed. It is under the judgment of God and to love it is idolatry. This is the world of Babylon, but the world as God's creation and God's idea of human society is good and loved by God. This world is what God intends to save. To love the world God created and to love the good intention God has for human society is to, co- is to cooperate with God's redemptive purposes in Christ. This is what the Jesus lovers in the Grapes of Wrath in their contemporary ilk have failed to understand. When Jesus says, for God so loved the world, He does not simply mean the individual people of the world. Jesus means that God loves the very idea of human society. God is not simply interested in saving parts of people, souls, for an afterlife in heaven. This kind of world-denying gospel is a gross distortion of the life-affirming gospel that is found in the New Testament and is always prone to foster the hostility of an us-versus-them divide. God wants to salvage and reform, save and redeem people, and in in so doing, save human society, or as it is positively called by Jesus in John 3, the world. But do Steinbeck's Jesus lovers, who sit in judgment of the Saturday night square dance with their hard condemning faces, really love the Jesus whose first miracle was to turn water into wine and keep the dance going? Jesus seems to be pro-dance. That is, Jesus endorses and participates in the celebration of humanness. In his birth and in his baptism, Jesus joined the human race. In his birth and in his baptism, Jesus transcended the us versus them divide. And in his crucifixion, Jesus killed the hostility that accompanies the us versus them attitude. But does joining the dance of humanness have dangers? In some ways, yes. At times, the line between the Babylon condemned by God and the Cana blessed by God is hard to distinguish. But to live as a world-denying, angry, judgmental separatist is such a betrayal of the logos, pathos, and ethos of Jesus as not to be an option. We must join, we must join the dance as those who believe that God loves the world and is saving the world in Christ We must joyfully belong to human society. We must join the dance. The church must creatively participate in the arts, music, poetry, literature, film, theater, athletics, education, entertainment, law, governance, business, finance, commerce, conservation, medicine, journalism, labor, science, research, philosophy, theology, and all that is necessary to produce a healthy, flourishing human society. We cannot sit with the pinched face world deniers secretly hoping the worst will befall those who dare to try to enjoy life. Those who do so forfeit any claim of being filled with the love of Christ, 
We cannot present the face of Christ to a broken world with an angry scowl. An honest reading of the Gospels makes it clear that the only sin that regularly aroused Jesus' anger was the sin of self-righteous religiosity. We must not be found guilty of trying to turn people into the Ophelia of Bob Dylan's Desolation Row. Now, Ophelia, she's neath the window. For her, I feel so afraid. On her 22nd birthday, she already is an old maid. To her, death is quite romantic. She wears an iron vest. Her professions, her religion. Her sin is her lifelessness. And though her eyes are fixed upon Noah's great rainbow, she spends her time peeking into desolation row. John Steinbeck in The Grapes of Wrath and Bob Dylan in Desolation Row are both describing the same distortion of Christianity, an angry, world-denying, hostile, separatist, us-versus-them Christianity. We must not be that way. Let us be neither Grapes of Wrath, legalists, nor Desolation Row religionists. Let's live and love God's good world. Let's embrace our shared humanity, join the dance, and be a part of God's mission to redeem his world. Redemption of the world requires, even demands, the eradication of groupthink hostility. Paul says that at the cross, Jesus killed the hostility. How does this work? Miroslav Volf explains it like this. The open arms of Christ on the cross are a sign that God does not want to be without the other, humanity and suffers humanity's violence in order to embrace it. As human beings, we divide into our us-versus-them groups and foster hostility. We do, do so by imagining that the line separating good and evil runs between our respective groups, so that we are the good us and they are the evil them. Such a division of good and evil is an illusion. The only legitimate good and evil divide between groups is the division between humanity and the Trinity. God, as the triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is good, while humanity is evil. This is what Jesus is alluding to when he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. The early church fathers were fond of describing the Trinity as a dance, an eternal dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit a shared dance of mutual love and joy. Humanity is the alienated other. Humanity is outside the dance, but humanity is not just the other, but the beloved other, the beloved other who has become an enemy. As Miroslav Volf suggests, when God went forth to embrace his enemy, the result was the cross, but it is the cross that makes room for the embrace of reconciliation. In the most agonizing moment of the cross, known as the cry of dereliction, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, we might imagine a break occurring in the eternal dance of the Trinity, a momentary fissure to make room for us. Now humanity is invited to join with God in the joyful dance of reconciliation, a dance that not only celebrates reconciliation, but also celebrates the death of hostility. When the son prayed upon the cross, Father, forgive them, it was a plea to end the hostilities between us and them. The prayer our Savior prayed as he was being crucified forever defines how the Christ follower must regard the alienated them. Hostility is no longer permitted. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must be willing to embrace the alienated them in forgiving love. This is how the hostility is killed. And this is how peace comes. I'm reading the books that have been most helpful to me in my personal, spiritual, and theological journey so that their messages can be spread far and wide to help others. If you are enjoying and being blessed by the works of these amazing authors, please consider, if you are able, purchasing a copy of your own and giving it to someone else to read so that the blessing of Jesus and his grace is spread even further through your gift and partnership in God's work. Thank you.